Does dark matter definitely exist? So one of the big questions that uh, is people in cosmology uh, are trying to address is whether dark matter exists. Um, one of the remarkable features about the standard picture of cosmology, the standard model if you like, is that um, about 95% of the total energy density in the universe is made of stuff that we don't know. Uh, roughly 25% is made up of this dark matter and uh, about 70% is made up of a thing called dark energy which uh, we we'll maybe discuss later uh, but 5% is made up of the stuff that you and I are made of, the baryons, the protons and neutrons and electrons. And this fits the data incredibly well. When people look out in the universe with their telescopes and their satellites and look at the distribution of light and look at the distribution of temperatures and look at the distribution of galaxies and you fit them to your cosmological models, having this 25% in dark matter, 70% in dark energy works beautifully. We don't know what dark energy is and we don't know what dark matter is. We don't know the nature of the objects that are making up the, the particles that are making up the dark matter. And so it has naturally led people to believe, to ask, even ask the question, are we just going down the wrong track here? Maybe it's gravity. Maybe it's not matter. Maybe what we're seeing here is a manifestation that gravity is not working and that we need to modify Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. And so there are proposals out there um, called modified gravity proposals that probably the most well known is called MOND, modified Newtonian dynamics where he, uh, a guy called Milgram came up with an idea to, to explain those rotations. Do you remember at the beginning we were talking about the rotation of the of the galaxies and to explain the velocities of the of the objects going around. He explained it in the following way. He said forget this dark matter, don't, don't need any dark matter. All I'm going to do is I'm going to say Newton's laws work very well close by to the centre of the galaxy but eventually Newton's laws break down and I, I, he just modified Newton's laws slightly. He changed the acceleration, uh, one parameter, just one number he put in and it fitted the rotation curves and in fact he claims that it fits all the rotation curves of all the galaxies that you see and then it not only does that this one, with this same parameter it then works on other scales and so people have started taking this seriously and then looking at it and trying to test it. And I think the consensus is that uh, when it comes to looking at some very particular issues like uh, features in the distribution of galaxies and in the distribution of the microwave background, this doesn't work very well. And again, you, the, the thing that works better is dark matter. It's definitely the case that within the community, the consensus is dark matter is there and we need to find it and that's where the push is, but certainly you have to have in the back of your mind all the time, maybe we're, we're wrong and maybe gravity needs to be modified. Does it frustrate you as someone who dreams of dark matter being discovered to know that it's here in this room? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's everywhere. The, and that you, it's just so elusive, it won't interact. It'll barely, it just passes straight through you. And uh, indeed, in order to try and find it, you have to go to areas where you increase the chance of it interacting with something. And so that typically is to go deep underground so that uh, you can hide, hide it from all the other type of signals from particles that might mimic dark matter, but that you know are not dark matter, things like gamma rays. So you go deep underground, the idea being that gamma rays, for example, and cosmic rays that come down and are showering on the Earth, they get dissipated, they break up into other things, create other particles that don't propagate through the earth. But the dark matter is so weakly interacting, it just passes straight through. And so you, you can be sh sure that it goes straight through most of the earth, down into the region that you're working in. And then you have some detectors which hopefully have a, are um, concentrated enough so that there are so many atoms in there that at least one of the dark matter particles will bounce off the atoms and in, in, in the detector and then we'll be able to pick up the signal. Maybe it'll be an electrical signal, a pulse which gets emitted or maybe it'll be um, some light that gets emitted and you detect it. 
uh, but this is really elusive stuff, maybe one per day if you're lucky, in a background of many tens of hundreds of thousands of, of events and you have to be able to be confident to pick up the odd signal. So not unnaturally, we haven't yet uh, been confident enough to say there's enough signal there to be able to see it. Are well, you saying there has been like false alarms or there have been some people who think there has been? Or? There are signals. There are signals out there. There, there are events that have been found um, that can't be accounted for in terms of known physics. Um, it's a really sophisticated program that, that the, uh, the uh, dark matter investigators go into to try and uh, discard everything that they know uh, is around that isn't dark matter and then eventually that you're still left with a handful of signals, a handful of events that have occurred, flashes and electrical impulses that have been sent off that you can't account for. You, you know they're not of the other type and then what do you do with it? What do you do with these few events? I mean, do you publish it and say, yep, yeah, this is it? So no, they're a bit more careful. They, the most recent case, the CDMS experiment, which uh, I think made an announcement in December, said we have two events, or maybe three, certainly two or three that we can't account for, that we, we know are not of known things, but they could still be backgrounds, they could still be the odd cosmic ray perhaps has got through and, and triggered something that looks like dark matter. These events do look like dark matter, but because there's only two, you don't say that that's dark matter yet. You need to build up the signals. And that's what the game is on to do, to increase the sensitivity of the detectors so they can interact more with the dark matter particles and then to build up the number of events so eventually sheer weight of numbers will tell you that this is likely to be a dark matter candidate. You probably want to know why we think it's out there in the first place. I would like to know that. <laughs> so this, this idea didn't just come out of thin air. We just didn't make up this idea of dark matter. It was in response to observations that we saw in the universe around us. And the first observation of that kind was made by um, a, an astronomer named Fritz Zwicky back in the 30s. And he was measuring the speeds of galaxies living in clusters of galaxies. So these are, these are groups of galaxies that are held together by gravity. They're sort of swarming around each other like a swarm of bees. And he realized that they were moving so fast that without something else to hold them together, they should just fly away from one another. So he postulated that there must be another piece of the puzzle that we couldn't see there. Something else providing enough mass to provide enough gravity to hold all these galaxies in this regular structure and keep them from flying off into space. And so he actually came up with the idea that there was something called dark matter. Now that, that idea just sort of drifted along in the background until the next development, which was in the 1970s. And an astronomer named Vera Rubin was studying the rotation curves of galaxies. Now galaxies, a lot of galaxies, like our own Milky Way, are spiral galaxies. So what we see are a disk, mainly, of gas and stars. And she was measuring the rotational speeds of stars at different points in, in the position of this disk. Now, think about the solar system for a moment. In our solar system, most of the mass is right in the middle. It's, it's ma made up of the sun. So the planets close to the sun, they feel a strong force of gravity, because gravity, Newton's laws of gravitation tell us that gravity falls away as one over the distance squared. So Mercury, for example, is zipping around the sun, while Neptune, further away, not feeling such a strong force of gravity, is just sort of pootling along very slowly. You'd expect something of the same to be happening in galaxies, because if you look at a galaxy, if you look at a spiral galaxy, it looks like it's got this big concentration of stars in the middle and this disk that extends out uh, even further but most of the mass seems to be in the middle. So one would expect that those stars in the middle would be zipping around and the ones right out at the edge would be taking their time. But what Vera Rubin found was that as far out as she went through the disks of these galaxies, those stars never slowed down. They were going just as fast on the outside as they were in the inside. And what this meant was, again, what you see is not what you get. It's not the whole story. 
there must be some other component, part of this galaxy, providing enough mass to keep these stars moving, even though they're far away from what looks to be the center of mass. And it turns out that almost every spiral galaxy we look at displays what we call this flat rotation curve. These velocities don't fall off as far out as we can measure them. And what that means, the simplest explanation we can come up with, is that these galaxies are embedded in a much larger halo of dark matter that's providing the gravitational force to produce these rotation curves. That makes it sound like something you've just made up because, you, because your sums don't work and things don't work. Why is it not... Why is it not that? Why, why aren't the sums or the equations wrong in the first place? That's, a, that's an excellent question. It actually leads into a really interesting illustration of the scientific method at work. So you've just displayed the characteristic of a really good scientist. You've been skeptical and you've said, okay, that's one explanation for the observations that we see. It doesn't mean it's the explanation. So yes, instead of just pulling mysterious dark matter out of the hat, why don't we say, maybe we've got our conception of gravity wrong. And there are groups of scientists who are working on that angle. Some of them are here, working on concepts of modified gravity, where we say, okay, Newton and Einstein didn't get it quite right. Let's see if we can change things a bit um, and, and still explain what we see. Um, so that's perfectly healthy. And the way that science progresses um, is that competing theories will both have to explain the existing observations and they also have, have to be falsifiable. So they have to make testable predictions that we can then go out and see which one um, fits, fits the observations better. And this process is, is occurring in parallel all the time. And um, I would, as an observer, I would say I think the balance of evidence at this point in time is in favor of dark matter. There's a lot more that I haven't told you about, but, but there's other pieces of the puzzle that are supporting this idea. Um, but it doesn't mean that we just dismiss this idea of modified gravity. Um, so it'll probably be a few years, if not longer, before this works itself out and we fully understand this bit of physics.